higher education is pretty much done for if, if something doesn't happen. What is that thing that needs to happen? Because it feels like it's being destroyed right in front of our eyes. Yeah, I think it's actually a great thing that it's literally burning to the ground. Burning to the ground. I think it's nothing could, I mean, it is a natural consequence of what they've been doing. So, I mean, of course, nobody should be surprised. And just to be clear about something, you know, people always correct me when I say higher education should be burned to the ground. They say he doesn't really mean it should be burned to the ground. I don't know. I mean, if you have an entire set of institutions that actually teach people to hate other people and to be racist, anti-racism is racism, and to destroy the meritocracy and to destroy the whole civilization. It's not clear to me why it would be a bad thing if those institutions stopped functioning at a, at a rudimentary level. Yeah, you better. Yeah, you better. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. You know we love having special guests on the show, and today we have a very special guest. He's been featured on our platform many a time, us reacting to his content, talking about the work that he's doing, and he's really good at really breaking down what wokeness is to its core, talking about some of the insanity happening in academia today, and he's a professor himself, or at least a former one at Portland State University. It's Peter Bogosian. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I feel very special. I know that I know I'm a very special guest. That makes, that makes me feel good. <laughs> it's a small thing to satisfy my... Uh, that, that's good. My, my self-esteem is now significantly boosted. Uh, thanks for oh. the co covering our stuff. You, you've done a great job. Really, a really thoughtful uh, presentation of the content we put out. So thanks. There's so much noise. Oh. It's hard to cut through the noise. Sure. Thank you so much for creating the thoughtful content that you are creating, because it feels like you're sort of filling a space that is very much needed, especially within academia. And you'd think there would be more people like you having the conversations that you're having and creating the content that you're creating. But it seems like we're living in an academic vacuum right now where those things aren't really existing. We're going to talk a little bit about that. I mentioned that you were a former Portland State University professor. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that, what you were doing at Portland State, and specifically this project that you were working on uh, alongside James Lindsay, where you were creating fake academic papers. Tell me a little bit more about that. Right. I just want to fast forward the story to the very, very end uh, of the story, <laughs> that is to today. Uh, Portland State University is under siege by Antifa. <laughs> you it's just true. can't make it up. You just can't make it up. They're under siege uh, because of the whole Israeli Gaza thing. I'd be willing to bet with odds that at least 50% of those people cannot find Gaza on the map. Hmm. So, so let's, let's, so that's, that's where we are currently at, at today. So let's back it up. So I was teaching. Sure. Uh, philosophy in the philosophy department is full-time faculty had a job for life called continuous employment uh, but the university slowly became ideologically captured it wasn't clear what was happening at, at first but over time it became clear so this is portland at portland state i try not to to talk i try not to even give them any publicity even if it's negative publicity because i don't want to uh the, the problem is that I don't want people going to an institution, students thinking that they're going to get an education, but they're not getting an education. What they're doing is that they're, they're becoming further steeped or indoctrinated into beliefs that are untethered to reality. So the university made it impossible for me to do my job. And, you know, when you mentioned before about what we do when we go out, we just basically teach people how to speak across divides and how to be more thoughtful uh, and calibrate their beliefs to the evidence they hold. And that's some mm. of those, some of the videos. So that's just called education. That's really not a radical idea at all. It's been around for, it's been around since Socrates, but only recently in the last 10 years has that become some kind of a, some kind of a radical thing to do. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because you would think in going into an institution like like any sort of higher education space, it would be all about discussion, all about hearing dissident viewpoints and going back and forth and having what could be combative discussions, but really should just be thought provoking discussions where we explore each other's beliefs, even if they are dissident to what we believe. How is it that the university campuses, which are supposed to be sort of the bastions of these sort of conversations, led to this point and, and got to this space where it seems as though you have to toe the line of a certain ideology just yeah. to be a student at one of these places? 
Yeah, so there's two things there that, how, how do we get there? So I'll talk about the genesis of that in a minute. But the other thing mm -hmm. is, so this is what happens. We create these environments when people think they have the right answers to moral questions, and they're positive of it. They're positive about it. And if someone else doesn't believe it, they're a bad person. And the Theotetus, Socrates says that if people had the same starting information, they would come to the same conclusions, you know, oversimplified, but that's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. if, if you and I have a difference of opinion, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means we just, just maybe we disagree about the border wall. Maybe we disagree about, you know, for example, I'm pro-abortion in the first trimester. Maybe we just disagree about that. Maybe we disagree about sur surrogacy, whatever we, but, but I don't, I'm not, my starting assumption is not that you're evil. My starting assumption isn't even that you're a moron. My starting assumption is that you have a disagreement and I want to figure out why you have the confidence you do in those beliefs. But when the starting assumption is, I know what's true, I need to teach my students what's true, I'm going to test them on what's true, and then they're going to get out into the world and they're going to institutionalize what's true. If that's your starting assumption, then you're no longer attempting to educate people. You're attempting mm -hmm. to indoctrinate them. And that's what we see the ubiquity of this on college campuses, particularly in the, in the hermeneutical sciences, soft sciences. It's in STEM, but it's in STEM to a, in a different kind of a way. Yeah, and let's talk about how it's managed to, to infiltrate uh, STEM and this project that you did where you sort of created these BS papers and submitted them to journals for publication. And I'm going to read this directly from my notes here, one of the titles of the papers that you created called The Conceptual Penis as a Social Construct. I'm going to allow you to break down exactly what you meant <laughs> by sure. that title. Sure, sure. So we, we had this idea that, well, we knew that, okay, so get, getting back, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. the oh, gross oversimplification is, I mean, I don't even, it's so complicated, but, but par part of it is that the lines, entire lines of literature became hij hijacked by ideologues. And so Alan Sokol, who's a friend of mine, wrote this thing called uh, this, uh, a, a paper in the late 90s, and he published it in a premier postmodern text, and he's a, a physicist and mathematician at NYU. And he did that to show that you can publish things in journals. These are peer-reviewed journals that have supposedly been vetted by experts in the field. And he did that to show that there's a misappropriation of scientific terms. If you make something sound kooky enough, it can get published, etc. So that was the inspiration for this. So uh, Jim and I, James Lindsay and I, were. Um, I told him that we should do that. And our initial idea was that we were going to write a, a paper that said potatoes are sexist, and we we're going to try to publish that. But fortunately, we Googled it, and a ton of other people had written papers about potatoes being sexist. So we're like, oh. okay, well, we can't do that idea. <laughs> and then, oh and then I goodness. think we kind of came up with the idea together that since everything is a construct, we believe literally everything is a construct. It's not that they don't believe in objective reality. They do, but they believe that it's mediated by power dynamics, and then those power dynamics reify or make constructs of things that we then form impressions of in our mind. But anyway, mm -hmm. so I, I said uh, – well, why don't we claim? Why don't we claim the penis is a construct? He's like, dude, that's a great idea. We wrote this paper, the conceptual penis is a social construct, and I'm not advocating uh, marijuana use. I don't smoke marijuana myself, but uh, if it's legal and people smoke it, this is the thing you should do when you're stoned. You should read this paper. This <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, good advice. Okay, okay. So, um, so the the paper itself is it, geez, it's filled with like every vulgarity. Every it's really funny. I mean, it's a legitimately. I think it's a very funny paper. So anyway, we published this, and you know these people, these people lost their minds. This doesn't prove what you think it does. You're you know you're transphobe or whatever. I'm like okay, whatever. But what was interesting is a few things were interesting as a result of that. One of the things that was interesting is that they said this doesn't, and we published a, something in Skeptic Magazine explaining why we did it. Mm -hmm. uh, people said, this doesn't prove what you want it to prove. If you want it to prove what you're claiming it proves, you would have done A, B, C, D, and E. And I'm like, wow, dude, that's awesome. A, B, let's do A, B, C, D, and E. Let's see. Let's see if we could do it. Yeah. You know, it was like more papers, more uh, journals in the field. Uh, they just gave us a, a checklist. And so then that was 2017. And then 2018, uh, Jim and I with Helen Pluckrose, we just started we just started cranking out these totally deranged papers. OK, so let's I want to I want to get to the root of what you think this points out about the system and about these these journals. Do you think, you know, that they're willing to publish these purely on an 
ideological front. They're just so ideologically possessed that if they have a paper that supports something that they personally believe, they're going to send it through and it's going to get published. Or is it more of an, an ignorance on their part that the peer review process isn't really extensive as it should be? Yeah, you're a very sweet person. You are very charitable <laughs> in your interpretation of these people. <laughs> I am okay, far let's too take the jaded. charity out of it then. I am far too jaded at this point after having oh. dealt with these people for so long. Okay, these people, and I love that term, these people, it's so othering, but it actually is true. These people mm -hmm. are vicious ideologues. I mean, they are just, they broker no conversation. They broker no dissent. That's why it just completely cracks me up when their universities are now being destroyed. And now they're claiming, that they're claiming they want dialogue. They're claiming they want dialogue when their yeah. universities are under siege by like maniacs. Okay. Yeah. Right. Whatever. You know, it's, uh, you know, the smallest microaggression, but you know, kill the Jews, whatever. We're cool with that. Everybody's cool. No, but I mean, these people are totally ideologically captured. I mean, they are true, true believers. So it's not just like, you know, they won't accept something that contradicts the narrative. It's like the whole thing, the whole enterprise is to forward certain conclusions. I mean, that's mm -hmm. literally the purpose of journals, like fat studies. There's an actual journey for fat studies. That is what its raison d'etre is, to promote certain worldviews. So it's not as if a paper that contradicts the worldview won't get published. Well, of course it won't get published, but that's what people don't understand. They don't understand about like the plagiarism problem. Like they don't understand all of these things are connected. You know, t 10 years ago when I was screaming about it from the rooftops, pe people would think I was a lunatic. And slowly over time now like, oh, holy sh schmoly. Uh, you know, Bogosian, <laughs> Bogosian was onto something, but it doesn't take any kind of great revelation to see that this stuff is total nonsense. I mean, come on, like yeah. obesity is not bad for you. Like, what are you talking about? Like that obesity is a narrative. Like what? You know, my mom died of bladder cancer because, you know, the obesity. Like, what do you mean? Ob That's just the craziest thing I've ever heard. You know, but the whole thing yeah. is like that. The whole system is set up like that. No, you're absolutely right. And it's so interesting because you you go down the rabbit hole of any of these uh, newer ideologies, the, the fat studies, the critical feminist theory, critical race theory, and you track it back and all, with, with almost like whole certainty with any of these, it will track you back to like journals that were published by these s supposedly notable entities that sort of validate this new worldview that is being ushered into the world and, and taught at universities. So you have to think, what the hell is going on at these journals that these papers are getting published? And that's exactly uh, what you and James Lindsay managed to uncover in this. And now, of course, a lot of people had criticism for you and said, you know, this is this proves nothing. And, and this, in fact, does not show that we are ideologically captured in any way. But of course they say that. I mean, they have right. to say that. They have to say that because they're the ones who gave us the checklist of things that, to do. So instead of saying, oh, geez, you know, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe there's a problem here. You know, may, maybe yeah. maybe we should be uh, take a serious look to, to, to see how much of this stuff is. Is it you know, double blind peer review? Is it how confident should we be in these assertions? Is it has this been vetted by people trying to disprove it and falsify it as opposed to people trying to make it even more crazy? That was, you know, one of the papers we submitted was about we said, uh, I don't know, is this can I can I uh, I don't know how, how graphic I can be on your show, but go for it. Go for it. Those papers it. are pretty. Those papers are pretty graphic. Mm -hmm. um, so so basically we had this idea. I can't remember whose idea it was that men don't like large objects inserted into their anus because they're homophobic. And so we okay. we put out this paper. <laughs> so we put out this paper and one of the reviewers, it's like it's like <laughs> one of the reviewers said, No, no, it's not because men are homophobic, it's because they're transphobic. And I got the oh. comment and I didn't even understand the comment. <laughs> and Jim's like, dude, this is genius. <laughs> this is genius. We're gonna rewrite this paper and claim that the reason guys don't like large objects shrams in their anus is not because they're homophobic. It's because <laughs> it's because they're transphobic. I mean, you oh, can't make it like, up. You just yeah, can't make this stuff up. So and, then and, and every turn, it seems like you are trying to, uh, you know, prove something, and they prove your point in the response. And in fact, they level up what it is that you're working on with yeah. delusion and inaccuracy. <laughs> I know it's just awesome, <sighs> isn't it? <laughs> Just, yeah, I, I just know. Awesome. I mean, I, I never would have had that thought. I love that you are very happy 
about yeah. this. I love yeah. that this makes you laugh. I don't know that it's making me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you and that do? it feels awesome. You know, the whole civilization is falling apart. <laughs> what are you going to do? You might be warning people no one listens to me. So f- watch it burn. <laughs> oh my gosh, Peter. You are. This is chaotic. I don't even know if this is controlled chaos at this point. This is just chaotic. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, so we get these papers, they get published. In fact, they're leveling up on the stupidity. But at some point, you make the decision of leaving Portland State University. And this is when you first really got on my radar, because this was a massively viral story when you decided to leave the university. And you point out the wokeness that is happening on the campus. You point out the fact that you're being targeted, not even really for your beliefs, but for your exploration of beliefs and and thought provoking conversation. Tell me about that. uh, And and when you finally made the decision to to leave the university, what was the the straw that broke the camel's back? Well, that's a great a great question. There's so much there. You know, just rewinding a little bit. You know, we, we seven papers in seven years is tenure. I can't remember. I think we got seven in or accepted in, and then we got busted by the Wall Street Journal. I think we had like thirteen, and we got better at writing them because we, we understood our fear initially was if they're too crazy, then someone's going to catch us. But no, they were never crazy right. enough. That's the thing. So this went on, and and. Like people were just constantly complaining about me and my call. Everyone was harassing me. I don't want to go through. It's kind of a bummer. But, uh, you know, they, they really made it impossible for me to do what I was hired to do, which is to teach critical, mostly critical thinking and ethics. And it became a terrible environment for me. And it, all of that over time achieved what they wanted it to achieve. But I don't know if there's like one specific thing. So I remember I went to the dean, the president. I asked the president of the university for five minutes of his time repeatedly. I published pieces about this too, I think in the Chronicle of I Heard It, and I mentioned it and he wouldn't give me his time. And um, I finally got five minutes of the Dean with the Dean. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch the gender around because I don't want people to know who the Dean was. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, I said that I'm deeply disturbed about what's happening to the university. And I talked to him about um, free speech, open inquiry, this kind of asking questions is a form of a microaggression or and i said to her you know we we've um portland state university is on the list of uh uh, foundation for individual rights and education worst schools for free speech and the dean said to me and i just blew my mind the dean said sometimes it's a good thing to be on those lists no it's a he said it's a good thing to be on those lists and Mm -hmm. it just because no one would talk to me or they'd accuse me when I asked questions of having a microaggression. And I realized at that point, like I truly realized like right from the top that this was a feature and not a bug. Like this is the point. The point is to take away free speech. The point. I mean, so so that was, but again, the whole thing occurred in the context of a pandemic and I had health insurance at the time and I probably would have left a lot sooner had these the confluence of factors not been what they were health concerns etc so uh so then i resigned and i was just i could not believe the traction that letter got like i mean holy (laughs) that letter was like all around the world and like multiple languages and i mean i my was email box was literally tens of thousands of emails from like Mm -hmm. i don't even characters i couldn't even recognize yeah it was it, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, that sounds uh, insane, actually. And it it makes sense, though, because you're pointing out something that a lot of people are feeling and thinking, but they don't feel comfortable uh, enough to say out loud and to really take what is a big step to leave the position that you're in at the university and say, you know what, I I have to let the world know that this is why this is happening. And it's very similar. And you hear these sort of stories with people who pop up in this space. When I was working for a very radical left-leaning organization, I started to realize Realize things very similar to to yourself and see the censorship. And one of the biggest issues that I faced was a lot of racism towards white people in, in the space that I was working in uh, from a group of people who claimed to be tolerant. And I had a very similar fork in the road experience where I went and spoke to the VP of the organization and said, well, wait a minute, I need to raise my hand here and let you know that there's things happening behind the scenes here that don't quite make sense. And they don't line up with the ideological values that we claim to have in this space and was 
turned away, very similar to your experience with uh, the, the said dean in this case. And I think of Thomas Sowell and the fact that he worked in the Labor Department and he raised his hand and said, well, I'm seeing all these issues. And he was turned away again and said, we're not really here to solve those problems. And what you point out is something important that it is sort of baked into the foundation of how right. universities and higher education work. It's not a small, acute issue. It's right. a chronic illness uh, that we're facing. And I think it's going to lead to more educators like yourself, the good educators, the ones who are willing to explore, just leaving. And these spaces are going to be completely devoid of any value. And they're just going to continue in this cycle. Do you agree? Don't I, I feel as though higher education has to be deteriorating beyond repair at some point. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's completely obvious. That's why you, you said <clears throat> there are a lot of things that you said there. Uh, yeah, so that's why I tried to build new things like the University of Austin in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a university that will, it's an excellent university. It's a university based on excellence and free speech. And it's very similar in a lot of ways to universities that we used to have before the vast ideological takeover, but it's learned many of the lessons and improved and made improvements upon pedagogical models and, you know, methods of instruction and faculty governance. I'm not at all Pollyanna would be the most charitable thing you could say about it. I'm very pessimistic about the American educational system. I'm extraordinarily pessimistic about the K-12 system where teachers get credentials credentialed by ideologues in universities before they could teach. And this is another discussion entirely, you know, because you have the accreditation bodies, which are basically cartels. It's, it's, a, it's a long, complicated problem. It's really interesting to see midwits, because these people are not particularly intelligent. They're not particularly hmm. insightful to watch the academies be taken over by astonishingly mediocre minds. And, and, you know, when you were talking, I was thinking about there's really a crisis of cowardice here. It would be like, I'm trying to think of an analogy. So uh, what do people use instead of the R word? Like, what's the word that people use? Mm, what is the word that people use instead of the R word? Challenged, maybe. Yeah, in, in Mandarin, in Mandarin, for the R word, people say uh, it's uh, meeting obstacles. He who meets obstacles, well, like one who meets obstacles. Okay. So you can substitute that for the R word. It's like some guy who meets obstacles walking down the road with a sledgehammer and just smashing the shit out of everything. And all these other people who meet obstacles are looking at this guy and smashing the shit out of things and they're like listen in this guy's lived experience he needs to smash the shit out of stuff and people right. are standing by the side of the, the side of the road they're like why are we letting this guy destroy the whole why are we letting him destroy the whole city block <laughs> it's totally crazy and then yeah. people and then people scream at the people telling him not <laughs> tell him that he should reconsider smashing everything and they call him a nazi and a lunatic i mean the whole it's just a complete inversion of any kind of sanity in the, whole, in the whole society. So, I mean, what else are you going to do but laugh? I mean, it's just, it's just, at some point, it just becomes so crazy that, I mean, and if you've seen, you know, our, our mutual friend, uh, Andy Noah, if you've seen these pictures of the people who get arrested, I mean, mm -hmm. these people, I mean, talk about meeting obstacles. These people truly <laughs> meet obstacles. And we've like let a small group of these people completely take over, like run roughshod. They we've let them like Mike Schmidt, the DA in, in Portland. He's just let them burn and loot. You know, like nobody, like almost no one's being. I mean, the whole thing is just so insane. I mean, it's, it's really so unbelievable. It's so crazy that, and then the mayor has pronouns in his bio, and the city's burning, and he's talking about he's talking about a trans genocide. <laughs> Oh no! I mean, you can't make it up. He's talking about a trans genocide. It's literally the city is burning. It's just so crazy. So, I mean, you literally—if you wrote a script about it, people would be like, "That's just too crazy." No, nobody could possibly believe it. But that's just the way we live, you know. It's just, yeah, that's just you know, I love are. that you find so much amusement in the stories that are happening. You've 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 seemingly gone through all the different stages of grief on, on this and you've landed in acceptance. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because you see these people take to the streets and it's almost as though 
I, I think with young people in particular and young left leaning people in particular, they have this sort of simmering despondence slash anger towards the world that just is, is constantly simmering within them. And they're just looking for X, Y, Z excuse to throw the anger out. And in 2020, it was George Floyd. We have this simmering anger. Now we can throw it out. Then it became the trans issue. We have this anger. We can throw it out. Now on university campuses, it's the uh, Israel power. Palestine conflict. Now we can throw out the anger that we we feel towards, you know, X, Y, Z. And a lot of them don't even know why they're there. Earlier you said, you know, I don't know that they could even point at Gaza on a map. Now, the interesting factor of oftentimes there's a very reasonable question somewhere hidden in the, the major protests that they're deciding to take on, but they jump to the most radical conclusion, the most radical effort. They're barricading off the colleges and they're not allowing students to go to their classes. What do you make of this, considering you're somebody who left a university campus because you saw the signs of this taking place? Well, I mean, the first thing you would need to do, I understand pe people are angry or they, they want a more just world or a more fair world, and they see disparities and they want to kind of remediate those disparities and they don't mm -hmm. want to be the cause of their... You know, Stephen Pinker talks about how the moral mind overrides the, the rational mind. But the first order of business is you have to make sure that you're protesting the right things. And I'm not an expert by literally any means. I know almost nothing about the Israeli-Palestinian problem. I just I got mm -hmm. my own domestic issues that I'm trying to deal with. So the first order of business, I mean, you can fact check yourself pretty easily. Just go online and get a get at one of those maps. I was actually thinking of doing this and and, you know, of the Middle East and a blank with no country names and see how many countries you can fill in. I actually did that in the Iraq beginning of the Iraq war with my students. I had them clean off their desk and I had a map, I put it on an overhead, and I uh, had them fill out countries surrounding, if they could fill out Iraq, you know, I numbered it one, two, three, four, five. And mm -hmm. if you can't fill out a certain number of countries, like if you don't even know the geography, it's unclear what you know. And you know, when yeah. I asked my neighbor here, how many in, well, not, I don't live, I had to leave Portland, but um, when I asked my old neighbor, how many African-Americans were killed by the police? And I can't remember what year it was. She said between 21,500 and 22,500. So it's like wow. all the cost. But the point is you have to make sure that your moral impulses are informed correctly. Like if they're not informed correctly, then you could be protesting the wrong things. Mm -hmm. So the first order of business is to make sure that you know that just because you have a sense of justice and a sense of morality, it doesn't mean that the thing that you're protesting for is going to bring about a more just world. So that, that would be the first order of business. And you can fact check that pretty easily. But but that's what happens. You Your moral mind overrides your desire to fact check anything. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. And it, it seems as though they skip. I can understand having a certain feeling towards what's happening, of course, and, and feeling um, a sense of that you must do something and you must speak out. But they're they're skipping the step of educating on the matter and jumping to the action, which is why I think we're getting a lot of these videos of these students not even being willing to have conversations. You're seeing right. reporters come to the students and right. say, hey, I just want to know why you're here. They right. won't even have that conversation. So Right. Yeah. So that's the difference historically where it is. Um, and th that's what happens when you create these educational infrastructures that don't value dialogue and discourse. When you you create systems in which asking sincere people asking sincere questions are, are met with some kind of punishment option or go to the diversity, equity and inclusion or r social ridicule. I mean, this is a net. There's this is an you don't need to be Nostradamus to figure this out. I mean, this is mm -hmm. an inevitable consequence of uh, creating systems that pretend to educate people, but actually indoctrinate them. That's why I think it's just so poetic to watch these institutions burn. And again, this is not a comment uh, about Israeli Palestine. It's not a comment about Gaza. It's not. Right. And, and there have been historical situations where students have occupied buildings. You know, we, we can look back at Kent State and other, other things. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about we, we're dealing with a kind of problem in in which the kids have been kids, quote unquote, in which students have been educated with a very particular way to view the world. 
and it's the Oboros, the Oboros, the snake that eats its own tail, is coming back to bite the people right now. Yeah, and, I've been seeing yeah. you posting that photo all over oh, yeah. X, formerly known as Twitter. Let's talk about the sentiment of the snake uh, eating its own tail, because often we'll say that uh, these individuals, because they're so adherent to ideology rather than thinking through uh, many of their stances, they do end up just biting their own tail and eating themselves alive. Is that what you're going for there? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an inevitable consequence. So if you teach people that the system is racist and the system is out to get you and every disparity in outcome couldn't possibly be due to culture, has to be due to, uh, you know, Heather McDonald said, if African Americans acted like Asian Americans for two generations, the uh, disparities still existed, then we can have an, a sincere conversation. Uh, uh, that's not how she phrased it, but that, then she'd be much more likely to except the idea of systemic racism. But a lot mm -hmm. of these are cultural factors, single parent households, et cetera. But nobody's talking about that. Or every time you bring that up, pe people are accusing you of all manner of heinousness. But, but the idea is that you've created a system in which the goal of education is to remediate oppression. It's because that remember the the other idea in this is o racism is the ordinary and everyday state of affairs. So we can I, I try I try not to talk about is Israel, but you know you have the whole white thing, you have the whole um, imposition of colonialism on you know people. You have the religious. I mean, it's a, it, the reason I don't talk about it, it's a complicated problem. And I'm sure, believe me, I'm same I'm here. No, I'm no expert, but the idea of the of the snake that that eats its own tail is you're creating monsters you're creating little mini ideologues who then go out and attack you and only then do you say wow now we need dialogue the very people who do literally everything they can to shut down dialogue and discourse and have institutional mecha mechanisms school you know like just just very quickly you asked about about the um, American institutions. I mean, if you look at mm -hmm. Harvard right now, Claudine Gay, serial plagiarist, she kept her job for ninety nine hundred thousand dollars a year, which is, I mean, it's, it's if it were a completely private institution, they can do whatever they want, but they take federal monies. But the problem with the Claudine Gay thing, and then the chief diversity officer, he got busted, or she got busted, the Title IX investigator got busted. They're all busted. All these people are corrupt. The whole thing is corrupt. But yeah, but if you look at that, that's not the deliverable that people should take home. The deliverable isn't that DEI offices are packed with people who are corrupt. I mean, we know they're packed with people. Any like that's just that's not the deliverable. Right. The deliverable, and the deliverable isn't even Harvard found her innocent of plagiarism in an investigation before they even conducted the investigation. It's not even that they didn't fire her, which is something you know. Like the whole system supports the corruption, but it's that the corruption is so endemic and it is so deep that it's the entire veins of literature, literally whole lines of literature have been corrupted and forwarding narratives, you know, and this gets back to the snake that eats its own tail. So this is the scholastic justification that everything is oppressor. So then, okay, so well then Portland State is an oppressor, then Columbia is an oppressor, then UCLA is an oppressor. So they're creating the conditions when you demean dialogue for long enough, the only thing people have access to is violence. There's no mm. other option. You either have a conversation about your problems or you start killing everybody or, you know, destroying stuff. But these yeah. are the people who have not allowed conversation. So of course, this is going to come back to bite them. That's the snake eating its own tail. That's these lines of literature when they're teaching these kids. They're just in dark. The whole thing is an ideology mill. All of it. All of it. hundred percent of it. And you'd think that people would realize it because it seems as though no matter which turn you take, you come back to the same conclusion of this sort of ideological corruption. And in, in looking at this, you, you can look at it and say, this is just We'll use the Israel-Palestine thing. We don't have to get into all that, but any student protests. I mean, we, we both appear on university campuses and we see the sort of protests that, that come in the wake of that and what students say. And you'd think, OK, well, this is maybe just a product of youthfulness and, and young people like to be dissidents and protest and they have that sort of energy about them. I had it as a young person. I'm sure you did, too. Uh, you know, then you hear that the faculty is also trying to get events canceled and is also, you know, uh, joining the students in their in their barricades and, and getting into the protest. So you go, well, I can't go one step up in the hierarchy and try to manage this issue. Let's go to the, the academic journals and the maybe higher institutions that right. bring about the faculty. They're just as corrupt. And you can start to feel like a very small ant trying to change the, the legs of the entire colony. And you feel as though, you know, this followed to its natural conclusion. 
higher education is pretty much done for if, if something doesn't happen. What is that thing that needs to happen? Because it feels like it's being destroyed right in front of our eyes. Yeah, I think it's actually a great thing that it's literally burning to the ground. I think it's nothing mm -hmm. could, not, I mean, I mean, it is a natural consequence of what they've been doing. So, I mean, of course, nobody should be surprised. And just to be clear about something, you know, people always correct me when I say higher education should be burned to the ground. They say he doesn't really mean it should be burned to the ground. I don't know. I mean, if you have an entire set of institutions that actually teach people to hate other people and to be racist, anti-racism is racism, and mm -hmm. to destroy the meritocracy and to destroy the whole civilization. It's not clear to me why it would be a bad thing if those institutions stopped functioning at a, at a rudimentary level. And, and I will fully admit right from the get go, which is a Dartmouth and a talk and someone, someone said rightly so, and I'll admit this from the get go. Yeah, it takes time and money to build new institutions, but I'm not sure what the alternative is hmm. other than to build new institutions. So I think, you know, and you didn't even, we didn't even talk a lot about the hiring that's not based upon, it's based upon exogenous characteristics like race. We didn't talk about citation justice, like, you know, forwarding the citations for people who have historical oppression variables. That's another problem. I mean, if you did that, there has been systemic discrimination in our past. There's no question about it. And if, and, and it's been pretty heinous. And if you did that, I mean, you, you wouldn't even be like even lens technologies, like you, you wouldn't even, have the just just the whole idea that you need to look at someone on the basis of their race and for their work is itself i mean everyone gets mad because i keep saying the word deranged but i can't think of any other word than to think the whole system is deranged so of course what we're seeing now as it plays out is a natural consequence of teaching people views of reality that are dangerous and harmful and divisive so i mean what do people think is going to happen oh and just one more thing and i'm sorry i'm talking a lot mm -hmm. No problem. I think it's great that people protest. People can protest anything they want. They should be able to protest 24-7. Great. There's a difference between, pro and I put this out in the beginning of the riots, there's a difference between protesting and riots. And when we call, we keep calling protests, we keep calling riots protests, one of the consequences of that is that you're, I don't know if it's an intentional obfuscation of what people are doing or to kind of way to excuse the behavior of people. But one of the consequences of that are, you know, small businesses get hurt, people get assaulted. Th these are not protests. Pro protests, you don't occupy a buildings and tell Jewish students they can't go to on camp. These, these are not, this is not protesting. This is, this is something entirely different that we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should, it's interesting. Yeah. You, you've pointed out something in that, and we talk about that often, is the, the obfuscation of, of language and how the packaging of something can really uh, sell to, to certain people, even though the packaging is by no means what the thing actually is. When you say Correct. protest, when it's actually a riot, when you say inclusivity, but it's actually exclusivity, uh, if you get, really get down to the root, anti-racism is actually racism. Right they're very mindful of the language that they use. And you have done a lot of work to sort of uncover this language and to give the, the true definitions of some of the words that we're seeing quite often down to, you know, even woke, which is what we hear a lot and many people can't even define themselves. Why is the language surrounding these different movements and isms important? The way that we speak is important because it the terms we use lock us into ways of thinking about the world, inclusion, equity, diversity. Most people of those words, I think most people have been hoodwinked by equity, equity, mm -hmm. and they, they use that. And it's amazing to me, people who have big platforms who you would think they would ask their assistant like Mark Cuban or someone. I never, never got involved in those conversations because they just seem too stupid to me. Yeah. Actually, the whole thing just seems too stupid. Everything is just Florence Reed from her. I just love this. I say this all the time. We are living in a uniquely stupid age. <laughs> this is totally <laughs> true. true. It's a uniquely stupid age. You'd think that some of these people would, would, you know, wealthy, rich influencers would know that there's a difference between equity and equality. And those things are literally antithetical to each other. But right. no, they don't, they don't seem to want to know. Or, you know, the equity has a nice valence. It, like it sounds nice. It kind of makes you feel good. Equity. And I hear people use the word equity all the time. But, but anyway, but but the way the words that we use trap us in ways of, the, of thinking about the world. And it's not pedantic. It's not academic. It's just you want to say what you mean. You know, a lot of 
mistakes or miscommunication in conversation comes because people use the same word, but they mean two different things. Yeah. And it's important that we define these things and that we call out the misuse of words, because I feel like that's what they do very masterfully with some of this woke ideology is the misuse of words and packaging them to sound wonderful because who wouldn't like diversity and inclusion and, and equity. But when we really get down to the root of them, they mean something wholly different. Now, I know some some people may have this question for you. You decided to take yourself out of academia. Do you feel as though there is still work that, that could be done by good educators in, in the space? Or is it, should we take it upon ourselves to remove ourselves from the space, build alternatives like you are currently building at the University of Austin? Yeah, I, there's no question about it. Uh, I told my daughter to be an electrician. You know, hmm. just go, going back to, um, I'll answer the question in a roundabout way. Sure. James Lindsay and I had an insanely productive partnership. Like we were cranking pieces out, books out, like, I mean, insanely productive. The only piece we never got accepted, we got one single piece that was never accepted. And that was when we argued for vocational education. Mm. Not only is there no shame in vocational education, it's honorable. You can get good, make good money. I think people should consider vocational education very seriously. And I think people should, you know, Ralston College is a new institution. There are new institutions that are popping up. I think with the rate of artificial intelligence progressing, it's pretty crazy. I was just at a, at a um, kind of a conference about that. So we may see different educational models break down. So one of those <clears throat> is, is for networking. There are networking possibilities. That's one of the things that call Colleges, particularly the elite colleges are good for. So mm -hmm. I don't I don't see anything salvageable about the institutions. And I think that the only way that people can learn their lessons and, and, the, and the reason I don't see anything salvageable about them is because people have tenure. Like if you were to do away the system of tenure, then I think we could talk about changing and institutionalizing new forms of intellectual currency. But you sure. can't do that because you have ideologues with jobs, jobs for life. So you're just locked into the whatever the delusions of these people happen to be and they've institutionalized them and, and their educational administrators. We did a great right. series with Lyle Asher who talked about a lot of these people have EDDs, ed docs, and then they go into administrative positions and then they institutionalize all of the nonsense that they've been taught. But it's totally, it's just totally ideological. It's just, just not, there's no evidence for it at all. Yeah, I could see uh, if, if I, I decided to skip higher education, I went for a little bit uh, to possibly pursue nursing and then it, my life took me in a different direction and now we do this. Uh, I could see, I hear a lot from students who are just getting into college or in the middle of college. And uh, if they're listening to this interview right now, the things are not sounding very optimistic for them. And they're, they're saying, I have to go to into higher ed because I want to be a, a doctor. I'm really interested in medicine or I, I really want to be a lawyer. What is your advice to those students who are in the space of ideological capture right now, who are writing papers about things that they don't necessarily believe? Do they stick under the radar, continue writing the, the bullshit papers and public and putting those through and giving them to their their teachers? Or do they stand up and, and say something to their their own, you know, lack of benefit? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a terrific question. It depends on what your goal is. So always, this is a great little, it comes from the seven habits of highly effective people. Begin with the end in mind. So figure out what mm -hmm. you want to do and work backwards. This guy, Dave Ellis, has some great stuff in this. Don't think when you think about your life, don't think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm 30. How, how old are you? 23. Holy that's young. Like, oh my God, that's crazy. I don't even remember when I was 23. I can't even. 23, that's like unbelievable. <clears throat> wow, you're pretty amazing at 23. That's astonishing. Wow, 23. Oh, thank you. That's so nice. Thank you. Yeah, it's true. Uh, okay, so let me put, so it's a 23. So think about, don't think about what do I want to be at 25? You know, do I want to build my platform or what do I want to be at 30? Don't do that. Mm -hmm. Think about where do I want to be at 50 or my age? I'm mm -hmm. 57. So like, I, so I'm 57. Where do I want to be? And then work back by 10 years. And that'll give you a more clear trajectory. So if you're in college and you're thinking about what to do and you can't take it, and I get emails all the time. I just had one, read one this morning from somebody who doesn't know what to do. You, you have a, a choice. The first thing is not everybody, but virtually everybody 
will, they're in the orbit of the ideology. So even mm -hmm. asking certain questions is a problem. And so college may not be the best environment in which to ask certain questions. But if you do have a question and you think the teacher might be open to it, always frame it like this. I'm curious, like I totally believe in this, like I, I got what you're saying, but I'm unclear. How do I respond if someone says X? And mm -hmm. the X there is what you actually believe. So you can frame it like that so you won't be reported to the diversity office. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is when you, you know, I, I, I saw some crazy statistic about that was anonymous. The number of people, the number of students who have written papers by chat GPT is off the chart right now. It's yeah. like, it's like the vast majority of people. So if educators want to deal with that, they have to start giving more in-class exams. Mm -hmm. But I, I would argue that there is a skill and if you have no other skill, reading and writing is, is good. So I would, I would say don't do chat GPT unless the class is just conspicuously ideological and then there's no point in doing anything else. But there are programs that, that can catch uh, AI writing. And there are also programs that can fix AI writing so it doesn't look like it's written, <laughs> written by an AI. So you have, a, you have right. another problem with cheating in the institutions right now. So my advice to people would be write your own papers. Don't use ChatGPT. Be super careful about you got to try to suss out your professor and everything's online now. So you can just search for people and see what kind of stuff. Um, as a general rule, the more identitarian someone is, the more they look at the classroom as an ideology mill. That's not a one to one. It's almost definitely true that the more identitarian one is, the more it's an ideology mill. But it could also be that they're not an identitarian, but they have another ideology that they want to promote that doesn't relate to identity things with an identity level salience like race, gender. So you need to be careful. And also you need to I, I would suggest think carefully about your friends groups, friend groups, mm. because friend groups make or break that experience for you. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I've got to say it is insane to hear uh, a former professor say, you know, think about the way you ask questions so you don't get reported to this entity. It's just a wild place to be in when it comes to education. And I think a through line in everything that we've talked about with the faculty, with the journals, with the students is how do we identify ideologues and how do we identify conversations that are worth happening, worth having? If we oh. can suss out the professors that are going to be open to dialogue, then we know where to sort of push the buttons and push our boundaries a little bit. These students who are having protests do not want to talk to media, do not want to explain why they're there. What is the tried and true way of identifying an ideologue before getting into a conversation that you can't get your way out of? How could that belief be wrong? Just ask them mm. that. How could your belief be wrong? Many people who are ideologues will say it can't be, it's impossible to, so, okay, well, mm. you know, and then you can make a decision if you want to have a conversation with them, you know, like, right. how could your so, belief be wrong about, you know, Gaza or whatever? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And, and if they say, you know, there's no way that I'm wrong about this issue, you can pretty much put your hands up and back out of that <laughs> conversation. Yeah, if, if you want. Uh, and so my, my response is, oh, wow, it's you, you, there's no way you can be wrong about that. So that belief wasn't formed on the basis of evidence mm -hmm. because to formulate a belief on the basis of evidence must mean that there's new evidence that could come in that would cause you to change your belief. And if they say it can't be wrong, you say, oh, well, then it wasn't formulated on the basis of evidence. What was it formulated on the basis of? Hmm. Like, how did you, was it, was it received wisdom? Was it just like, how did you, how do you know that? Right. And you've sort of, I guess, come to this conclusion through your studies, but also through practicing these conversations. You do these street epistemology videos where you go uh, oftentimes to university campuses and speak to the students about differing I ideas, anything from can a man be a woman to are men funnier than women to, to issues of race, despite your experience in academia and the, the combative nature of it, you continue to show up at university campuses. Campuses and, and to spark these conversations. Why is that? And what do you glean from these conversations? That's a really good question. We don't do it just at universities. We do it all around the world. Mm -hmm. we, we were just in we, every London, Puerto Rico, Australia. I, I want to say awesome. one more th one more thing while it's still on my mind. Sure. Um, the other thing that you can do, just rewinding a little bit, the other thing you can do is you can say to somebody, because your, your question is really good because I'm certain other people have it as well. So it, it's worth lingering mm -hmm. on it for a second. You could say, what would you say about someone who had the exact opposite belief that you have when you ask them the question, what would it take to change your mind? And they said nothing. What would you say about that person? And usually they'll say, oh, they're brainwashed or whatever. But the idea is you, you want them to think about that because you're actually asking them about themselves. Right. Okay. So sort of flip it back. It makes it yeah. a more comfortable question, I guess. Yeah. Without 
but if people take it personally, if, if people think it's personally about them, then they'll be their defensive posture will be invoked and then they'll never answer it. Okay. So that was that. Right. So then you asked me, so t- tell me, sorry again, re- fast forward. Oh, you uh, asked the me, street epistemologies. What, what oh, makes yeah. you continue to go uh, to all, all over and have these, have these conversations and sort of push, push the boundaries of conversation with people? Because people need to understand that it's possible to have a civil conversation with someone with whom you have substantive disagreements. In fact, it's not, not only is it possible, it's not really that difficult at all. I just did a, I'm an atheist. I just did a um, show with a Christian apologist the, the other day, just yesterday, a live stream. And he's a perfectly reasonable guy. We have pretty different views about reality. Okay, that's mm-hmm. that's that's fine too. You don't have to agree with everyone. Was Thomas Jefferson said, you know, you can let friends be wrong. That's fine. But we go around both to show people that it's possible to have those conversations across divides, and to help people align or calibrate their confidence in the belief with the evidence and reason they have for that belief. And nobody is, as far as I know, no one's really doing that. Like nobody's really teaching people that there are, I mean, certainly the university is teaching exactly the opposite. So no one's really teaching people how to think, be more thoughtful about your beliefs and how confident you are in those beliefs. And again, this stuff isn't particularly complicated to do. I mean, it's you, anybody can learn. You just watch a few videos and you'll be able to learn how to do it. I mean, it's not particularly complicated, but nobody's doing it because people don't value those that dialogue and discourse. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting because I'm, I'm all constantly thinking about how do you bring about a resurgence of interest in actual dialogue? And I think part of it is just proving to people that it can happen and it can go smoothly. And that's a, a big part of what you do with your, your street epistemology videos. Although sometimes they don't go too smoothly and you have right. uh, students and people who are very upset with the line of questioning or, you know, make accusations at you uh, for your line of questioning, which was really, really profound because often you think a question is the best way to package uh, your your conversation or to start off a conversation because there's really no attack uh, in in a line of questioning. You're just curious. But even now people are catching on to that and saying, well, the very question is transphobic or the fact that you're even asking this is racist. How do you deal with uh, an individual like that? Is it further questioning? Is it further probing? Everybody asks me that. You know, the, the one thing that people ask me more than every, any, any other question is, how do you keep your cool? Mm-hmm. Uh, I get that a lot. And the answer is, I'm like, I'm legitimately, I'm like genuinely curious as to why someone would believe something. Like, it doesn't <laughs> matter what it is. And I think if you're, if that posture is one of curiosity, then it, it, it really helps. And again, it gets back to what I said about the Theotetus. You know, if, if I had their life experience and I was around people who were indoctrinating me, I would probably think, think the same thing that they do. F- fortunately, I've not had those set of life experiences and I, I do value listening to different opinions and talking to different people. I don't, maybe I got lucky, maybe it's a disposition, I don't, I don't really know. But hmm. I think p- part of it is to figure out how someone knows what they know. So instead of delivering a message and having a conclusion, like, oh, like, how, how do you know that? And then seeing if they know something you don't know, then you can know it too. But invariably, their confidence in their conclusions is not justified by the reason and evidence they have for it. And most people, Aristotle says, you know, people want to know what's true. I believe that people want to know what's true. I don't believe that people knowingly want to know things that are false or or knowingly want to believe things that are false. And so just a few targeted questions can usually expose that pretty quickly. And, And, you know, most people are pretty pretty uh, receptive to that. The people who aren't, interestingly enough, they have commonalities. Here's a commonality of people who won't do it. Older people tend to not come to these. Younger people will literally get off a bike and come and start talking to us. That's one commonality. The people who are offended are much more likely to be Americans on college campuses, students. Foreigners, you almost ne- almost never, I mean, sometimes you, you get, but people out of the country, uh, you know, like f- we were at Flinders Station, some guy gave me the Hitler salute in Australia, in, in Melbourne. But or, mm-hmm. you know, we did these in Hungary. Not a single person in Hungary or Romania ever was upset, like or offended or what have you. So uh, it, it's a lot of it is what we're teaching people. We're teaching people to be offended as opposed to how to how to engage people in discourse. Yeah, I, I, it's very true. I think it's a, it's a cultural illness. And when you talk about the fact that, that cultural illness does not really exist elsewhere, it's very much true. And I've seen that in my experience as well. We are running out of time here. Okay. So I, I'm trying to think on a, on a last note question. You've mentioned a few things that people can do to sort of mitigate what's happening right now. 
But if if people say, I really want to dedicate myself to having our country and our culture come back from this, what are their what are their next steps? It's completely possible that we can come back from this. It's completely possible that we can prevent the slide of Western civilization. But it's only possible if people want to do it. And right mm-hmm. now, we got an awful lot of people who simply don't want to do it. Right. So, that, so that puts the whole thing in hard mode. So if you want to do it, here, here's some things I would suggest to you. First of all, there's no, no one right answer to the question. There's certainly a lot of wrong answers to the question, like a wrong answer to the question, just play video games in your basement. So some, some kind of action. So the first order of business, I would say, is try to clean up your own life. Try to clean up your diet. Diet, sleep, and exercise are always a, a good thing. Uh, it's particularly important because our friendships are under strain. And one of the things that nurtures a lot of us through life are those community and community relationships we have. So make sure that your own house is in order. Peterson talks about cleaning your room. But I would say cut out the sugars in terms of diet. Exercise rigorously five days a week at least. And then um, try, try to sleep. Don't uh, sleep shame yourself if you need to sleep in. Right. Okay. Now, beyond that, think about the relationships you have. It will make your life far more interesting if you have people, if you surround yourself with at least some people with whom you have disagreements. So I would say that you don't have to agree with 100% of everything. In fact, there are good and bad reasons to end a friendship. But And of course, we all have deal breakers, right? But political differences should not end a friendship. And I would argue metaphysical differences should not end a friendship. Religious differences, unless someone's a, really an extremist, should probably not end a friendship. But again, there are there are lines. There are lines there. So 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 think about think about your friendship and how to be a good friend and how to be kind to people, particularly in your friend group. And think about really listening when people tell you something. That's important. The other thing is be more mindful of your consumption of social media. So Haidt has a new book about this, but often w- one thing that happens is we tend to take the criticisms very seriously and we tend to take the positive comments very seriously. But mm. it's likely that those are truncated and that people really don't mean, they don't mean it with the fervor they say. And so if somebody criticizes, criticizes you online, in all likeliness, they're just, you know, having, you know, shits and giggles or gags. And so I, so trying to figure out which of those criticisms matters is important. So, you know, I have, I have friends in my life and if I screw up with something, I I would hope that they would tell me. So I, you need to figure out whose voice doesn't matter. And the answer to that question is most people, but people Mm. you respect, people you trust, when they tell you something, you need to really listen. So I think we're listening to the wrong people. The other thing that that people can do that's pretty easy, pretty simple, well, I don't know, maybe it's not that simple, but it's somewhat simple, is really listen to people who have a different viewpoint than they do. And I realize the society is so acrimonious and bitter and everybody's pissed off all the time about everything, but try to really figure out when you listen, why do people believe that? Like, what reason would somebody have for believing that? And even asking that question can humanize people in in a way. Now, to be sure, there are ideologues, many of whom are in college campuses. And at some point, you know, you realize that there is no reason. And Hannah Arendt talks about, the philosopher talks about, the, the, the whole idea of an ideology means that you think it's true. And so you have people who genuinely believe things are true and even when you listen to those people, you, you may not change their mind or you may not change your own mind, but what you will get out of it is you'll understand why they believe it. And then once you do that, you can move your own epistemic, you know, how you formulate knowledge and you can have better conversations with those people. But most of it deals with conversations. But before you even do that in this crazy age we live in, you have to take care of your body. You have to take care of yourself yeah. and you have to take care of your friendships. That's my first line of it. That's what I say. love that. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of things working against us today. And there's so many temptations toward what will lead to further sickness and lack of conversation and lack of friendship. And you really have to fight that acknowledge that that exists and then fight it with with all your might, it seems sometimes. And I think we're all on the journey to do exactly that. I can't thank you enough for 
uh, sort of entering in the the conversation of health because that's another very important and valid point uh, when we're dealing with these things. If you're not of healthy mind and body, there's not much you're going to be able to do to deal with yep. all the other stuff that's happening in the clown world that we live yep. in today. Peter, I know people are going to want to hear more from you. Where can they follow you? What do you have going on at the University of Austin? Tell us everything. You, I'm on YouTube. We're on everything. I've started to use Instagram. Uh, I'm on X, formerly Twitter. Uh, I I have a Substack. I just I don't know. I'm just a little bit fr- frenzy all over the place. with all this stuff. I'm really trying to take pictures. I'm always amazed when I take pictures of my breakfast and I have like you know thousands of people looking at what I eat for breakfast. <laughs> it's just the weirdest thing. I eat the same thing for breakfast every day. I eat bacon and eggs and maybe a piece of fruit. That's the world we're living in. <laughs> so yep. So so I'm all over the place, and I'm I'm uh, I'll be in San Francisco next week, and then I'll be in New York, and then we just travel. We just travel all over the world doing the street epistemology, and so we don't announce our locations usually until right where we get, just because of safety concerns. Sure thing. Yeah. So I appreciate you know the opportunity to be on the opportunity to have a conversation with you, and I appreciate the thoughtful analysis that you do of our videos. So thank you oh, so man. much. Appreciate Thank that. you so much. And back at you for doing everything that you do. Of course, I know you're going to keep it up. You've been like in a frenzy working, and no. <laughs> putting out all this work. So I, I know that's going to continue, but I'm sure many of our audience is going to want to go and follow you and catch everything that you're doing. So we'll put links in the description down below. Peter, again, thank you for Thanks. being on the show. Thanks. And good luck with your new ventures. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, you better. Yeah, you better.